Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. For many of us, modern design went from science fiction to reality when we were watching the 1972 Munich Olympic Games. At the heart of the Olympic Park was the Olympus Stadion by architect Gunther Benisch and engineer Frey Otto. Its clear tent-like structure was both unworldly and organic, modern and yet elemental, like the first tent structures humankind would have made. And like a lot of design from that era, it portended a new kind of future that somehow was never realized. The modern Olympic Games began in 1894 and were based on the ancient Greek custom of warring states putting down their weapons to engage in non-lethal sport. It was hoped that such interaction would bring about peace. Modern Olympic history is imperfect and complex, and those issues are probably addressed better elsewhere. Here we will discuss the architectural aspect and how the Olympiad, held every four years, is a herald of new architecture as it focuses attention on a particular world city. Perhaps if I were a little older, I might have been as impressed with the 1960 Rome Games. Buildings featured here included Pierre Luigi Nerve's Palazzo della Sport, the House of Sport, which is 330 feet in diameter using a reinforced concrete dome rib system, the Palazzetto della Sport, the little house of sport, and its mere 200 foot diameter concrete dome held up by the perimeter Y columns, and Stadio Flaminio and its concrete supported grandstand canopy. All of them use Nerve's own highly efficient ferro cement system concrete reinforced with steel employing both prefabrication and on-site forming using less steel and wood forms than conventional reinforced concrete systems. For Nerve, it was a chance to build big and bold as he and other architects had hoped to do for the 1942 Esposizione Universale Roma, AOR, featured in Architecture Codex number 10 and number 27. For the Munich Games, a design competition was announced in 1967. Gunther Benisch's firm was inspired by the tent structure constructed by Frey Otto for the German Pavilion at the Montreal Expo of 1967. The Montreal design borrowed the poles and tensile cables that we recognize as circus tents and not permanent architecture. These cables and poles help frame a spider's web of steel mesh covered with transparent polyester fabric. For the Munich design, Benicia's staff made a model that used small wood dowels and women's hosiery to illustrate the proposed canopies. Their design was eliminated in the first round as too daring, but one juror intervened and eventually the design was resubmitted and was ultimately selected. The design was probably the most organic sports arena built, at least up until that time. The flowing canopies provided some protection from sun and rain, but they also appeared to emerge as if growing up from the ground. Unlike the Montreal design, this one used clear acrylic panels fixed rigidly to the steel mesh. Once again, I believe that its appeal is that the building's form speaks of its structure. They are the same thing. It is not an illusion and therefore a true expression. It is perhaps the very opposite of the compressive form of the Gothic churches, and yet both have an equal amount of power. The stands below the canopy are nested in organically formed earthen berms. Computer modeling of buildings had not progressed as far as it would eventually, so Otto used a bit of trial and error on scaled models and an early form of CAD analysis to make the structure work. Like the TWA terminal, Architecture Codex No. 1, today's technology was built to make buildings like the Olympus Stadia 
easier to design. Nearly every sports stadium ever built was inspired by the Roman Colosseum, officially the Flavian Amphitheater. That may be because the design is very basic. You have a bowl that featured tiered seating around the field of action. The Colosseum itself was a combination of two theaters, thus the phrase amphitheater or amphitheater two theaters. These Roman theaters were buildings inspired by the Greek theaters, which tended to be carved into hills rather than erected on top of flat land. The Roman Colosseum had its own canopy system that consisted of ropes and rolls of canvas supported by wood staves along the perimeter at the top to protect the occupants from sun and the occasional light rain. The tensile roofs covered other buildings and walkways at the Olympic Park, including the natatorium, the building where swimming and diving events occurred. So the design concept developed by Otto and promoted by Benish created a visual identity for the entire sports park. While constructed as temporary buildings, their acclaim was so great that the city kept the canopies over the buildings. By the time I got to the stadium, about seven years after the Olympics, the overall buildings and their canopies were simply accepted as everyday Munich sporting life. Sort of like the Renaissance structures in the Borghese Gardens in Rome. Still, as an architecture student and an outsider to the city, I found them amazing and inspiring. While extensively used for parks, and let's call them outdoor structures, the use of tensile structures for more conventional buildings has simply just not caught on. I suspect there are two main reasons for this. One is technical. The roof does not transition well into walls to create an airtight seal. So this is problematic with buildings where heating and energy costs are a consideration. I investigated a commercial tensile system for a Christian church I was designing, and we would have to engage some extensive compensating factors to achieve a reasonable energy profile, even though a translucent ceiling would softly light the space below, saving on lighting costs, and help heat it in the winter. The second factor, I suspect, is that people have just not seen enough of them and don't really trust them. Perhaps the most enduring design legacy to come out of the 1972 Munich Olympic Games was not the architecture, but the innovative graphic signage, the pictograms designed by Mark Gellin. These graphics expressed each of the sports and activities using stylized human forms that did not require language to understand, a logical goal given the many international competitors. While previously the signs might have been translated into a few of the major and widespread languages, these signs needed no translation. And pictogram images, round-headed people with fingerless limbs, are now common throughout the world. Since Rome and Munich, the Beijing Olympics in 2008 had the best chance of making a lasting impression. The Chinese Communist Party certainly made an effort to impress the world. The opening ceremonies were simultaneously astounding and scary. A bit too easy how so many people were regimented into the exacting performance. The Bird's Nest Stadium by Herzog and Demeron is an impressive building, but stylistically it was ho-hum different. Contrasting it was the Water Cube, officially the Beijing National Aquatic Center, which was designed by a consortium of architects, engineers, and contractors. Here, the aesthetic is derived from natural patterns of soap bubbles. Both the bird's nest and the water cube represent strong, arbitrary design ideas which needed to advance technology to be executed. And in that sense, isn't that the opposite of how things are to happen? It isn't, here's what I want to build, make it happen, but rather, here's a new kind of technology, what kind of form can we build with it? For that reason, Neither of the premier buildings of the Beijing Olympics had the raw structural honesty of the buildings of the Rome or Munich Olympics. We look to the Olympics to see the things we do not normally see. Peaceful cooperation among nations. That does not always happen. 
We also look for talented sports people who, after years of dedication, try to excel when often their sport is otherwise ignored by the world. Maybe that's why I like the track and field events most. Call me a cranky old man, but I think that basketball players, soccer players, and other athletes for whom there are high paying professional leagues are not really necessary at the Olympics. I want to see the sports I do not normally see, and I want to see the event in its entirety. I don't want it interrupted by constant video sidebars that get up close and personal. Cranky old man. And I want to see experiments in urban design, construction, and architecture in these temporary villages that house tens of thousands of people. The Olympic parks, villages, and arenas have replaced the World's Fair as the preeminent experimental urban design that occurs on a regular basis in world cities. So let the architecture games begin. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex.